Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining this lunchtime. Uh, this session on the accessible information regulations. I'm Tim Rivet. I'm going to be uh, running this session uh, this afternoon. And we're going to, uh, I'll do a bit of an introduction to Artig for those of you that haven't come across us before. Um, I'll then run through um, a quick uh, high level view of the regulations. Um, and then uh, most of the time I want to uh, make this uh, a, a Q&A and try and understand from yourselves how um, in particular in this session, local authorities might be able to help with the regulations and a grant that uh, Artig's got from the Department of Transport. And um, got other sessions that are focused on suppliers and operators. Uh, we've had some of that. So today I'm going to try and focus on uh, uh, authorities and uh, let's see, we've got a on here. So, um, so yeah, I'm Tim Rivet. Um, I run Artig on a day to day basis. Artig, for those of you that haven't come across, has been going for uh, 20 years or so. And we are all about public transport technology and working with stakeholders across the whole of the industry from central government through to authorities, bus operators, suppliers and consultants. Uh, and we are these days uh, pretty much wholly uh, membership funded. And we do uh, a number of different things. We've got an increasing library of technical documentation for standards. Uh, and good practice guidance covering uh, a range of different things to do with public transport technology. We do a lot of work with uh, organisations like the BSI in the UK and SEN in Europe to help develop some of the technical standards that we use on a day to day basis in the industry and we hold uh, educational events uh, increasingly like this, but we do face to face events uh, as well and have working groups where people get together with a common interest and talk about uh, experiences that we can then turn into uh, advice and guidance for people that uh, know a bit less about things. Uh, that's Artig. Um, the accessible information regulations. Um, I'm only going to do a quick high level view um, of them and some of the uh, the key points um, because I want to understand what questions you've got and and that sort of thing as I laid out to start with. Um, so accessible information regulations are uh, the sister of the bus open data regulations. Um, they um, cover uh, local buses and coach services with a requirement to provide audible announcements and visual information to people on vehicle so that they know the route and the direction that it's traveling, uh, what the uh, next stop is and if there's any disruption messaging, uh, particularly diversions. If you've been to London, any time in the last decade or so and been on a bus, then it's uh, those sort of information and requirements that you will have seen on their buses. Uh, and I see we've got somebody from TfL uh, on here. Um, there's also an increasing number of uh, vehicles outside of London that are equipped, but um, it's not a high enough proportion to uh, really benefit people that need some additional help traveling, which is why these regulations have been bought in. Um, it's applicable, unlike the bus open data regulations, 
to uh, which is England only. This is applicable to the whole of England, Scotland and Wales. Uh, there are similar requirements in Northern Ireland, but it's under different uh, legislation. Um, but uh, as always, there's a few exemptions which we'll have a, uh, a look at in a minute. But if you uh, if you operate anywhere within uh, the uh, the UK, you're you're covered. So, um, like a number of um, vehicle based uh regulations it's based on dates um and compliance is, is based on when you first you well when the vehicle was first used so it might not be when you first got it as an operator it will be the first time that vehicle was used for uh, local public service so if you've got it second hand for example cascaded from london or a big operator um then uh, it's when they first started using it um if you're buying a new bus after uh october next year it's got to be equipped from day one um if you've got a vehicle that's uh new from october 2019 so uh four years old at the moment five years next year then uh, you've got to uh, equip your vehicle with uh, the required kit and make it compliant by October 24. Um, and then you can go all the way up to uh, 50 year old vehicles, which you've got until uh, October 2026 20, to, uh, to have things fitted and be compliant. Vehicles before 1973 regarded as heritage and therefore uh, not subject to uh, the requirements. There's nothing to stop somebody fitting them, though, but it's not legally required. Um, there is provision for vehicles that have got some form of audio visual equipment on already, uh, and that's called partial compliance. So if you've got a vehicle that's equipped with a uh, display, inside it, for example, and that's in place before October this year, then uh, you're required to keep it on the vehicle and maintain it. If it doesn't quite meet the requirements for some reason, then um, you've got until October 2031 to make it compliant. Uh, and the reason for this is uh, we don't want people removing kit on vehicle that's already partially compliant and putting the effort into that if they've got vehicles that haven't got any equipment on uh, the department would much rather see um, vehicles uh, with some partial um, compliance than uh, than with nothing um, if you've got just a display on the vehicle then you need to make sure that the audio side of things is sorted out based on the date that uh, was on the previous slide um, so that you've got audio and visual uh, equipment uh, by the right date, but you don't need to get rid of partially uh, non-compliant kit um, because the focus, as I say, wants to be on making sure that it's on as many vehicles as possible. Um, there are some exceptions to the requirements. Uh, they're fairly standard for local bus service stuff. If it's a very small bus, less than 17 passengers. Um, if it's a heritage vehicle, if it's only ever used on excursions and tours, for example, um, home to school services, those sort of things. Um, and uh, community bus has got uh, some uh, exemptions as well so what do you need to do you need to provide audio announcements and we'll come on to what those requirements are in terms of what you need to uh, provide on the screens and uh, audio in a bit but um 51 percent of people on the vehicle needs to be able to hear the announcements 
uh, at a level that is uh, loud enough for them to be able to understand it over the background noise of a vehicle. Um, and that's been worked out at about three decibels um, above background noise. Um, quite a lot of systems will auto adjust the volume uh, for you, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, there are some, though, that need manual setting. Um, there is a requirement in there that, that those announcements um, don't mean that the noise in the vehicle is greater than 84 decibels. Where does that come from? That comes from health and safety law. If you expose an employee to uh, sounds more than 84 decibels on a regular basis, then you need to be mitigating that, uh, either reducing it or providing here some form of hearing protection and things like that. So that's why the 84 decibels is there. Um, that's a going to be a challenge in some older vehicles, particularly in hilly areas. Um, but um, uh, we can't, these regulations can't override health and safety law. Um, as well as um, it coming out over the speakers, you also need to be providing it through an induction loop. Um, you, though, only have to provide it in the priority and wheelchair space areas. If you are going to provide it wider than that, then great. But the requirement is within that priority wheelchair space area. Um, the visual displays, they need to be visible to 51% of seated passengers. Um, if you've got a full bus and you've got standing passengers, then um, that um, is allowed and the requirement for 51% um, of seated passengers uh, goes away. This is for where you don't have any standers in the way and things like that. Um, it's got a minimum character height requirement of 22 millimetres. Um, where does that come from? That comes from uh, a limitation on uh, some double-decker vehicles where the only realistic place to put a display is behind the bulkhead um, of the stairs and you've got quite limited space there. Um, if you can provide greater than that, then that's going to be good and make it easier for you to uh, meet the 51% uh, requirement. If you're buying new vehicles that are being delivered after October next year, then you need to um, provide two displays on the lower deck, one of them rearward facing for passengers that are seated facing forward, uh, and another one that is facing forwards for rearward facing wheelchair users. Um, if you've got vehicles going in now, make sure that you've got the order and the specification you know going in with the manufacturer um, but there's no there's no requirement to um, um, retrofit um, forward face facing displays for existing vehicles. So um, that's the audio and visual coverage requirements. Um, what information needs to be provided. So you need to provide route information to passengers. So uh, whenever the vehicle stops at the start and every time the doors open effectively to let somebody on, then you need to uh, let people know the name or the number of the service, uh, where it's going to, um, its final stopping point, but if it's a circular service, for example, and that's a little arbitrary, then uh, clockwise uh, or anti-clockwise, um, something that's going to give people an idea that they're on the right bus in the right direction. Um, and then you need to tell people uh, before the last stop that the, uh, the, the journey is about to end and they'll need to uh, to get off the bus. So that's the route information. Um, at each stop, 
whether or not you are stopping, you need to announce the next scheduled stopping place. So um, just after you leave um, a stop, you need to tell people what the next stop is. Um, even if it's not stopping there, that's because there might be somebody on the vehicle that um, wants it, not pressed the bell yet and things like that. Um, the the challenge here is that um, you've really got to allow enough time for people to hear the message saying, you know, the next stop is Church Street Marketplace. Uh, process that find the bell, press the bell and the driver to stop safely. Um, that is recognised as a challenge in some urban environments where you've got stops quite close together um, and the road speed um, between them is uh, is quite quick. Um, so, you know, it might need to be a bit of tweaking and playing around with that um, between operators and suppliers to, uh, to be able to uh, to, to achieve that. Then um, if there's a diversion, you need to tell people that the bus is um, ideally about to go on a diversion before it um, goes on it so people can get off um, if they don't, if they're wanting somewhere between the start of the diversion and the end. So if you know about it in advance before the last stop the last normal stop. If you don't know about it, you've come across a uh, a road collision, road closure suddenly for whatever reason, then you need to be letting people know as soon as possible uh, that the vehicle's on diversion and then um, when it's back on the normal route. So um, that's a quick run through of the core fundamentals of the um, regulations. Um, don't know whether anybody's got any questions about them, queries. Thank you for watching this Artig webinar. To find out more about Artig and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you. Thank <music> you.